Right. The meaning that has been established <coughs> by current legal decisions, that's what the term means. It's a very difficult way to think, but <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Timothy Schmeling, and for those who don't know me, I teach uh, exegetical and historical theology here at Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary. We're now at the final discussion period, and this lasts roughly from 2, it can go up to about 3.30 if uh, we have questions to do that. Um, it's a chance for uh, each one of our speakers now to react to each other's papers. Once we've completed their reactions, we'll open up the discussion to the floor and invite you guys to come up and uh, offer questions to the speakers. At that point, I invite you to do it from the microphone in the back. Please state your name, where you're from. One other point of order, Dr. Stegmeier has to leave uh, at some point to catch a flight back to California. So after we have the reactions, if we can privilege at least the questions that are directed to him, try to put those up forward just so that uh, we can ask those before he has to leave. And with that, we are first of all going to have reactions to Dr. Uh, Stegmeier's paper, and we'll begin with Dr. Manoush. All right, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Scott, I very much appreciated your uh, paper, and I look forward to uh, reading this because I understand this is going to be uh, part of a, a book uh, later on. Um, for the most part, I thoroughly uh, agree with it. I have one sort of question that centers on um, your discussion of the image of God. At one point, you say that some theologians do agree that a wider definition of image may be allowed. And the issue is that uh, certainly um, when we think of the image of God in terms of original righteousness, there's no doubt that that's been lost by the fall, but there's a, um, a great paper by my uh, colleague, uh, Nathan Jastrom, Man is Male and Female Created in the Image of God, where he argues that in Scripture as a whole, um, image of God is, is used in a, um, a range of senses, the core meaning just meaning to be like God. And he argues, for example, that uh, right after the fall, Genesis 9, 6, you have God saying, um, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood will be shed, for man was made in the image of God. The context being that um, now you're entitled to eat animals, but that doesn't mean, in effect, that you can uh, treat human beings uh, as animals. And in the New Testament, James uh, 3, 9, where he's talking about the vice of the tongue, um, he says, well, the same mouth, we, we uh, praise God, and yet we um, curse our, br our brother who was made in the image of God. And so what that suggests is that there is a secondary uh, enduring sense of the image of God, just as our vocation to be stewards of the rest of the world did not go away just because of the fall. I wonder if it would be worth exploring if there is this secondary sense. Because while I agree with you that we should um, center stage the idea that we are beings capable of justification, and justification is a ground for human dignity, I'm not quite so willing to just drop the image of God uh, idea as a basis for, for human dignity. At least that's, that's my feeling. And I, and I, and I, and I don't think you are entirely either, by the way, but I just would like to hear your comments on, on that whole issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I know the Jastrom article, and John Kleinig has also written a lot about, uh, well, I mean, this, this uh, Genesis material about uh, image of God. And, uh, and in Genesis 9-6, in fact, it's in my notes here, I, just in case someone asked me about it. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I do think the same thing. I, I don't want to jettison the concept in a secondary sense, as you said, of our creation in the image of God. And, and so in my paper, when I talked about um, Dr. Jeff Gibbs, uh, he does want to jettison that concept entirely from ethics. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I was trying to engage him a little bit, and I finally said that I don't find his case 
completely convincing that we cannot any longer use that concept. I try to not stir up controversy and confusion where I don't need to. So sometimes I'm talking to a Lutheran audience. I try not to, depending on what I think, how, you know, if they're going to be very dogmatic about uh, it only can refer to the original righteousness, then I may, I may, uh, I may not want to get too distracted on that. So my paper may have been a bit unclear, but that, but that is my intent, is to say okay. that I do think as creatures um, there is some sense, not the righteousness part at all, which is completely lost, but there is some sense that we are, we have a continuation um, as, uh, as God's perhaps vice regents upon the earth. Um, the context of that uh, image of God statement in Genesis uh, is right around the male-female. So maybe the male-female uh, relationship in some way images the deity. Uh, so so I, 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 I'm very comfortable using that as, so I would see kind of a twofold way. Um, if someone is completely opposed to speaking of the image of God in a Lutheran context, and if I don't have something else, then it's like, well, then why, right? Then why, what is our exceptionalism based on? And so I think, I think Gibbs' point about universal justification uh, is, is also a very helpful way to define um, the meaning of being a human. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I really don't want to say that it... We can't speak of some cre so that's why sometimes I like to try and join creation and justification and compare them as both part of this, right? So we are created ex nihilo, and uh, we're justified ex nihilo, right? God's word bespeaks us righteous, and so, um, so yeah, I, I think there is a strong connection between our creation, which isn't gone because we don't stop being those same creatures. Uh, just because we have lost faith in righteousness and, and love of God in that way. All right, very good. I did have, can I have one more question? My, my other question had to do with the fact that, as you know, some theologians like to think of um, the image of God in relational terms and also then more broadly the relational view of persons, which is very important in uh, Trinitarian theology. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have views about whether the church should be using as an apologetic um, a relational understanding of persons because even on the outside of the church, I think that people are beginning to see that our uh, secular models are treating individuals as a bag of statistics. So mm. in the healthcare setting, you're a, you're, you're a collection of, of symptoms. And I think we have an opportunity to say that, wait a minute, there's Peter Seeger and his mother. Because he, because he has this relationship, mm -hmm. he suddenly discovers something about himself that he has this personal responsibility that's defined by that given relationship. And, and, and is, is that a tact that we should be trying to uh, take to convince people that actually they already do believe in a relational view of, of persons? And if so, they might be interested in understanding how that could be true. Are you asking if the relational is somehow tied to the image? Yeah, well, I, 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 I see it as perhaps, I, I think that we're made in the triune image of God, and I think that that is very significant. In other words, it's not just that we're made in the image of God, but we're made in the image um, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's a, there's a loving relationship uh, between the persons of the Trinity, and then it's not surprising to read in Genesis 2.18 that it's not good for the man to be alone. In other yeah. words, that we're, we're made for relationship, and I'm wondering if, if that's a key thing that we should be trying to um, help people to see that they really do believe that at some, at some uh, level. I, uh, of course, I, I totally agree. <laughs> Again, I agree with everything you just said. Now, sometimes there's some discomfort because in theology, sometimes people talk about the social trinity, tr social trinitarianism, and, uh, and there may be some excesses to avoid with that, but I do think there is wisdom in seeing imago dei, because again, in Genesis 1, when, when we are called image of God, it's specifically in the creation of man and woman created in the image of God. And that's a relation. In fact, it's even more. It's a marriage. And so I think we can uh, biblically defend and kind of examine uh, the idea of 
of this interrelationship. You said we are created for intercommunion with other human beings, and that is so true. We are hardwired for that. Um, yes, God says of everything, it is good, it is good, it is good, uh, but it's not good for a man to be alone. And of course, it's not not good in the sense of some kind of lack of righteousness. And of course, God, and of course Adam wasn't alone. He was with God. But in some kind of a temporal way, some kind of an earthly way, uh, man is not meant. So, so Eve was not a second thought, right? Um, it, it, you know, it's not like God discovered and realized, oh, okay, Adam needs a partner. It was always the intent to, to create Eve. Um, and so, uh, you know, so she's not like a plan B for his happiness. Um, you know, he's not happy enough in God's <laughs> perfect communion, so he needs, needs this add-on. That's not at all the case, right? So I do think we can look at... Uh, you know, even when I talk about marriage, when I teach about, teach about family, not that you have to be married in order to image God, of course, but that uh, we, are, we are designed and oriented even in our bodies for another, okay? Uh, you, you know, the, your uh, reproductive system is the only part of your biology that, cannot, that, that serves no function by yourself, right? You don't need a partner for your nervous system to work or your circulatory system. But your reproductive system, as created by God, uh, must have uh, a complementary partner. So that is creationally the intent that this happen. And even if one doesn't marry, not that that's a necessity, but that uh, but you're still oriented biologically for that, right, by the Creator. So I do think that in the uh, and you you talked about the Trinitarian idea and and when I again when I teach about marriage and I define love, I think as a great way to say love is, is that it is the self-giving of one to another. And that is what the, that's what, you know, the father uh, gives himself to the son, the son gives himself to the father. This is a Trinitarian um, uh, interrelationship that is, I think, also what marriage is, right? True marriage, you know, love is to uh, give oneself, submit to one another, right, in Ephesians 5, to give oneself to the other. In what way does the husband love the church, or his bride? As Christ loves the church. Well, how does Christ love the church? God so loved the world that he gave his son for the world. So that uh, relational definition of what it means to be human is, I think, very, does resonate well in our, in our society. Um, there are statistics that show that American, contemporary Americans, there's an epidemic of loneliness. There's data for this. There are statistics to show that... Um, that people are chronically lonely and that it causes all sorts of bad health outcomes and social outcomes, even, I think, um, political bad outcomes because people are just uh, deeply lonely. And, uh, you know, they would say, how many close friends does the typical American adult man, male, have? And, you know, how, the, the, the statistic is shocking at how many adult men say they have zero close friends. Um, so, so this idea of us being created for relation, first of all, of course, our relationship to God, communion with God through Christ, is our primary uh, uh, source of our meaning and purpose. But that, that is, and I, like I say, in, in our culture where this is an underlying sense, um, uh, I, I think that, that can receive a very positive hearing when we teach that, that what it means to be human is that the Creator desires this community and, of course, the church and our teaching on the family are ways that God provides that. You know, you know it's not good, um, you know, for man to be alone, but, you know, the lonely find a home, you know, in, in the church or in the family. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I very much appreciated your your paper, and especially um, the applications that are sprinkled throughout it. I, I really appreciated those. Um, I had a couple of questions, if I might. Um, one is, uh, you mentioned the eugenicists, and, and you specifically mentioned Charles Mayo and, and, and uh, have a quote by him, and you go into things like social Darwinism and things like that. Mm -hmm. Does it seem to you that that this is on the way back? No, oh, that, yeah. that this is coming back, and and um, 
What are some of those signs maybe that you see of that? Yes, good observation. I absolutely think that. I've done uh, some research and an extensive reading in the history of the eugenics movement in the Anglo-American world, um, in part because it is back. Uh, we are not building death camps, perhaps, but we are looking for a ways to take control of our genes and the, and the genes which we pass on. And good genes, of course, is the word eugenics. Now, what, uh, what we're seeing, though, is now that we can do more with genetic ma manipulation and gene editing technologies, uh, we will be given, I believe, uh, greater uh, control or power over the very biological nature of our children. Right, so if I can edit the genes of an embryo to cure a disease, perhaps like cystic fibrosis, if I have the technology to change the genes of a, of a human embryo so that it doesn't develop that disease, mm -hmm. well then in theory I could change genes to do other desirable things and remove other undesirable things that are not health, right, not therapeutic, but just socially desired. Now, now we're not there, but there is, a, you know, we're not uh, pouring as much money into genetic research as we are only so that we can you know, uh, do things like change eye color, perhaps. But there's, there, there will be financial uh, drive, or there'll be consumerist desire to have the ability to modify our children. And even apart from maybe that generation or two down capability, IVF, in vitro fertilization, right? So when you uh, create, uh, uh, say, 20 embryos in a Petri dish uh, for an infertile couple, right, in vitro fertilization, um, they don't, you can't transfer 20 embryos to a woman's uterus safely. So you pick which ones will be done and then they do, do genetic screening to see which ones to, to, Down syndrome, no, we won't use that one. We'll do this, or we only want boys, so only give me male embryos. That's a form of, again, of taking control of our progeny in a way that is about our will and desire. Not, you know, if we don't see uh, children as gift from, the, from God who gives all good things, but rather as a project for our own fulfillment, at least in part, then we have dehumanized our children, which will certainly affect them psychologically and spiritually. So I see those kinds of technologies, IVF and perhaps gene editing as things that are here and uh, growing in use, IVF for instance, exploding in its use as ways for people to, uh, to make choices about what features they find uh, attractive in, in their future children. And what does it mean to be a child now to know that um, you, know, you were chosen because uh, of certain traits they desire you to have, and maybe you don't have those, maybe it doesn't express itself. So those are some eugenic moves that are, I, 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 you know, I think there's some eugenic motivation going on there. Um, everything from, um, you know, research ethics and so forth, where there's been uh, choices upon, you know, who, with whom to do research, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or whatever. So there's probably eugenics motivations there in terms of how we treat people of other races in, in medical research. We have a history of that. So there's, it, it's not gone. Uh, it's not gone. We want to have, uh, you know, designer children, if, if, if you'll say that. The difference, when I talk to people about this and suggest to them that this is, it sounds like eugenics to me, what they'll tell me is in response is that, no, it's nothing like that. It's nothing like that because what they see is the big difference is the role of the state. That um, it, as long as it's by free choice, consent, autonomy, then it can't be considered eugenics and that, you know, we can't have that stigma because what made the early American eugenics experiment is that we were forcibly sterilizing people that we found to be undesired. We were forcibly, um, and then of course, I mean, it was, it was the National Socialists, they had their own uh, anti-Semitism, but the National Socialists in the 20s and 30s were reading American uh, eugenicists and getting ideas, and there was correspondence going there, we have this. And uh, so it's not impossible to imagine that people would want to not just sterilize the so-called unfit, but uh, maybe to even take more um, direct measures to prevent. So, but that's how people will look at it. They'll say, well, no, it's okay to design your genes and so forth uh, to have the kind of child you want as long as it's not state enforced. Okay, well, that's, that's perhaps a distinction. I'll just make one last statement. Uh, there's a book, uh, uh, and its um, title exact is gonna uh, not come to my mind right now, 
but it's uh, something like A Case Against Perfection or something like that by Sandal. It's not a Christian, but he writes uh, from a non-Christian perspective this uh, tr very concerned opinion about the desire to have the perfect child. And uh, so I, I would commend that to your reading. I think it's called The Case Against Perfection. Yeah, thank you. I, I see this too. It, it, it kind of scares me to see. When, when CRISPR came out, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing um, set of enzymes and, and a, a system that you can use to, to fairly easily edit genes inside cells and inside animals as well, whole animals and, and things. Um, I wondered how long it would be before they were willing to use that on people. And, it, and there are people already who want to do it and are held back by laws in, in our country or, or by agreements. Maybe it's international agreements right now, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if we've passed a law against it, but there's an agreement right now among, in the scientific community. But, but um, some countries don't, don't mm -hmm. adhere to those very, well, very much. And so I just wondered, well, thank you. Well, if we, if we can design uh, genetically modified organisms such as plants or crops to be more pest resistant or drought resistant, theoretically we could modify human beings and other animals to have certain traits that we wish to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, there are some societies that won't have the same ethical qualms that we might, and then that makes us less competitive, you might say, if they're making super soldiers or something like that. Um, and uh, I mean, this is somewhat futuristic, but we have the ability, we have er early ability right now already with the kinds of gene technologies, gene editing technologies that we should definitely keep our eye on as Christians. Are those orcs, those super soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when Peter Jackson made that movie, he, I think he is kind of, you know, implicitly showing that they're manufacturing people or whatever that can have the features that we want. And it's... I mean, there are a lot. Science fiction is a in fantasy, and even some horror movies are great places to mine uh, for uh, bioethical discussions. Well, I have another one, um, and um, this gets at the the ethic that uh, that the Christian is a helper to other others in our in our society. And how, how do we draw this line? This may be an impossible question. I don't know. I hope I'm not asking an impossible question. But, but it seems to me that there's a, there's a line that we can cross where we are enablers, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to helping people. Mm -hmm. And um, where we can promote charity to such a degree that, that we are enabling people and, and actually promoting their own, um, uh, I don't know, uh, keeping, keeping them from, from, from what they can do themselves to raise themselves up. Yeah. Yeah. You would like me to respond? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yes, I mean, so on the one hand, sometimes we think that love means license, right? That you just simply want to affirm everything they want to do, even if you suspect those are going to be harmful to them and others. Mm -hmm. um, but it's unloving to say no or to not let them pursue their, their own identity or authenticity. So sometimes we must, we're trying to be loving, right? We're try, we, we believe maybe our heart's in the right place in a way, um, but we are actually sometimes saying no to someone or, or pointing out or criticizing something is the most compassionate thing to do. Um, also, I think you're talking about, um, you know, is it good for us to continually help someone and then they become dependent? I don't know if that's kind of what you were that asking actually, too. Yeah. 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 And uh, so social ethics, right? I mean, I think that all these things tie together. Our three, our three feet subfields are all very interrelated. And uh, so, so for sure, when we think about things like welfare and charitable giving and so forth, um, you know, you want to more than just give someone, say, food, but help them to, you know, you give a man a fish, he can eat a day, you teach him how to fish. Um, so that's why we sometimes, you know, we talk about mercy and justice. And uh, as I look at those words, mercy is giving the starving person a bowl of rice. Uh, justice, and you know, it, there can be bad ways to talk about social justice too, right? But I think justice might be said, well, what can we do um, either politically or scientifically so that they don't need us to give them 
uh, right and grow their own? Or why is it that these people are um, engaging in antisocial behavior? We can give them counseling, but is there some things we can change that might prevent them from needing to do that or becoming dependent on, on uh, just us giving, giving, giving? Um, so, so, you know, when we talk about mercy in the LCMS, Matt Harrison, before he became the Missouri the president, uh, wrote a lot of things on mercy works, giving, and, and while that should be, we should emphasize that ever more so, but uh, also, you know, what can we do, if you want to say it this way, systemically or socially, um, even politically, that can perhaps, uh, with, that, are, that are well within the boundaries of our faith, that might actually improve the, the society uh, so that it's not ne necessary for them to continually receive handouts or so forth. Thank you. I will. Okay, so react to, uh, react to my friend, Dr. Manoj. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, so yes, as I, as I said, thank you both for your papers. Um, you know, I had the privilege or, or um, horrifying thing of going first, <laughs> but I did get to listen to, to both of you, and I'm always, you know, I'm seeing, oh, that's the, I, I like that, and I can use that, what you just said. And, uh, and I overheard you say, uh, Dr. Manoj, that you're good friends with Robert Bene. Benny, yeah, as an ethicist, and he wrote a book, and I don't recall that you cited this book, um, Good and Bad Ways to Think About Religion and Politics. Um, I, I uh, show that to my students, and, and sometimes we look at parts of that together. And uh, now, uh, religion does have public ramifications, right? There's um, ways that uh, our faith is lived out, and I think sometimes Christians, and I wonder if you agree with this, that sometimes Christians, I use the word isolationism or quietism, um, that we are afraid of, uh, as the one author said, um, of confusing salvation with sociology. We're so afraid of that and the errors of liberal Protestantism, which is substitute gospel preaching with, uh, you know, social reform. If we're so afraid of that, that we, in order to correct it, we overcorrect. And uh, in our churches, especially evangelical type churches or fundamentalists, we become so isolated uh, do, you, do you think that confessional Lutherans, and you were addressing this, but I wonder if you could expand on that, expand on that, of ways that we as can be true to our confession, but while also intentionally, you know, we preach the gospel and justification and long gospel, and, uh, and, and righteousness and, and sanctification flows out of that naturally, but sometimes we do need to, third use of the law, we need to tell people how to be good citizens, right? And so do you, do you agree with me that maybe we sometimes are guilty of overcorrecting and being afraid to talk about social ethics? Yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And the reason that we have become afraid is because we have let the culture dictate the, the terms of the discourse. And that is that the culture constantly cries that if you take a uh, strong biblical position that you're imposing your political views on someone. And yet it seems to me that if we look at the tremendous um, riches that we have within uh, the doctrines of the two kingdoms and of vocation, they actually provide resources for an entirely moral argument. It could be buttressed by um, natural law arguments. What we're looking at are what are the actual responsibilities of an office holder, and we could make arguments that some ways they conduct their office clearly tend to the uh, benefit of people in their care and otherwise uh, lead to um, great harm and, and um, all kinds of uh, social problems. And so that when we make these cases, whether it be for uh, school choice um, or if, it, if um, it be on any issue where we are arguing that the, that the family be um, uh, re respected in the decisions it, it makes um, for the r raising of its children, we need to make that as a strong biblical moral argument and make it as clear as we possibly can that this is in no sense part of a political uh, agenda. But I think that's what's led to this, is that we've been sort of cowed into silence because we don't want to be perceived as pushing an ideological agenda. Actually, we've got resources for a much stronger moral argument. And I think that we have a great cultural moment right now because as we're seeing, parents consider different choices for the education of their children. Part of it is they've run into 
uh, a natural law argument in front of their face. In other words, they don't want this for their children. So they may not be Christians, but they sure know that they don't want this. That then should provide us an opportunity as to, to explain why not. And, it, and I think it also would help us to um, develop the kind of um, anthropological uh, arguments that you, that you use for, for, for bioethics. So I think we need to have a much bolder, more public witness, but it must be done carefully so that um, we are not simply uh, dismissed as being uh, uh, advancing party political agendas. Thank you. On that. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the two things, one of the, not one of the two things, one of the things I appreciated was your combining and showing the complementary nature. And I, I love it when, when, a, when I'm sitting there and, and a, somebody's talking about something and all of a sudden go, duh, I didn't ever think of this before. And uh, the complementary nature of the two kingdoms. And uh, of course they're not opposed, but, but I never gave it much thought that they were actually, um, of course, complementary like that. And, and uh, so I appreciated that very much. And I, I'm curious about something. Um, first off, First off, I just want to ask about this. This gets at the political discourse because you, you brought in a fair bit about offices and uh, the offices that people hold, and some of those are governmental offices. And that, that uh, exposes a person to a lot of criticism from, from either side. And since the days of Twitter and Facebook and uh, and some of the other uh, social media, I, I'm noticing and I'm wondering um, uh, the, the way conservatives oftentimes are, and somebody mentioned this to me the other day and, I, and they were concerned about it and, and I thought, wow, so am I. And, and uh, uh, the way that conservatives are referring to their opponents with ridicule or, uh, or uh, derogatory terms, uh, foul language oftentimes, um, doesn't speak very well to me or, or m maybe even to the rest of society. And yet, s some of these are, are Christians, uh, Christian websites. And I just wonder, have you, have you noticed any of that or do you, do you keep up with any of that? Have you, have you read it? And, and yeah, that certainly is a problem, and it's, it's certainly a um, horrible witness. We should always begin with recognizing uh, the neighbor and recognizing the fellow image bearers. And I think that that passage I mentioned before about James, it doesn't make sense to praise and bless God while cursing our neighbor who's made in the image of God. When we do that, we do a double wrong. We dishonor someone who God made specially valuable, and we dishonor his creator as, as, as well. Uh, so I think that it is a time for us to be especially good at, if you like, loving our enemy, really. That is to say, we really must take that seriously, that they, ideologically we may be enemies, but these are fellow um, image bearers, and we must treat them with the absolute dignity and, and respect that they uh, deserve. And our goal is always to win them. We're all vocations are there to fulfill the love of neighbor. And so we must be directed toward their good if we're doing anything else. If we are dismissing them, then I think we're dishonoring them and we're dishonoring uh, God. So we are called to a much, much higher, higher standard. I think that's a very excellent question. Regards, in regards to places like Concordia Mequon and Bethany and, and other Christian colleges, I'm, I'm just going to ask it like this, I think. Um, will the day come 
when we'll have to forsake accreditation by the national accrediting bodies? And, and then what takes its place? Uh, or, or if anything, or is there something to take, take its place? Um, but do, do you, know, you know what I'm referring to? As, yeah, so one thing, there's a, a couple of models that are out there. One is to go the whole way, like Hillsdale uh, College and Luther Classical College, and, and, and really forswear the whole idea of federal funds and accreditation. The other, though, might be to see if we can't develop alternative accreditation. So in an organization that, that um, I have a lot of dealings with, the Consortium of Classical and Lutheran Education, they're developing their own accreditation for classical schools. And the idea is that then you can have something that assures people of standards, but also that is congruent with your founding mission and purpose. So I think we should start to think very seriously about that as a possibility if we, if we have to go that way. Uh, accreditors initially told us that um, all they were going to do is to find out what our internal governing principles were and then make sure that we were doing a good job of that. That has turned out over time not to be true, that they also have agendas of their own. And right now it's difficult, but perhaps tolerable, but it may indeed come the time where it's intolerable. Um, I think alternative accreditation system may be the way to go. Thank you. So Dr. Holberg, uh, oh, I think I turned it off. Right. Uh, Dr. Holberg, again, you know, I think uh, Christian biologists and Christian bioethicists, we walk hand in hand. So many of the things you said, I. I found very helpful for my own thinking, too. Um, and uh, yeah, we both know about Peter Singer, and we both referred to him in our papers. And uh, of course, he's often seen as kind of an extreme example, but I think he's less so than we want to believe he is. And he's the father of animal rights movement and uh, talks a lot about animal liberation. Uh, and, but I really appreciated that what you said. That your line was something to the effect of, we don't have to worship nature to want to save an elephant. Right, and uh, I, I just wonder if you might um, talk a little bit more about that. What do you mean by save an elephant? Are you talking about habitat destruction or um, you know experimentation on animals? Um, could you maybe be a little more specific about how Christians, not just elephants, but uh, you know how should we view animal experimentation or, like I said, habitat destruction uh, without becoming Gaia worshippers? Yes. Yeah, and I actually originally had something about that in my paper, and it, it was just too long. Of course, yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes. Well, so let's talk about animal experimentation for a minute. Um, lots of medicines have been developed, and, and uh, much of the time we learn whether they're safe or not for mammals, and we're mammals, uh, whether these medications are safe for mammals. Um, it doesn't mean they'll be safe for every mammal, but we learn whether they're safe uh, by testing these on animals. And it, it generally starts with mice and rats. And, uh, and as a drug goes up the chain of uh, you know, the, the hierarchy to, to where it finally gets uh, approval to be used on human beings, they've often tried them on dogs and monkeys. And at times, some of these procedures can cause great distress to these animals, great pain sometimes. And sort of like we, like we mentioned uh, at lunch, I think, uh, you have to very carefully weigh the cost and, and benefit ratio of this, I think. And should we do this, for example, for cosmetics? Yeah, I don't know if I, if I would agree that we ought to do this for cosmetics, you know? <laughs> maybe, but to cause the great pain, I think maybe not. On the other hand, uh, there are ways of minimizing animal suffering when you're trying out different medications. You can, you can uh, intubate them and put them to sleep and, and then see what their bodily response is. Sometimes that's not very possible because you want to see what's going on when they're awake. And, and, uh, and, and, um, and so sometimes it's just not possible. 
some medicines, especially some of the anti-tumor drugs, the anti-cancer drugs, are, are hard on people and hard on animals. And, uh, but we wouldn't have them without those experiments. And so I think um, if the ultimate benefit is for people who, um, uh, like Dr. Minut says, are image bearers, then I think we say the cost is worth it at that point. But we do want to try and minimize it as much as we can. And we haven't always done that, I don't think. You know, um, you can find experiment. I, one of the, one of the uh, classical experiments is, is an experiment, of course they did this with a human being too, but uh, of an experiment where uh, to find out how the digestive system works, a dog's abdo abdomen was opened up and then just sort of left as a flap that they would open and close whenever the, the dog would eat and they would check in on it, right? Now, animals don't necessarily feel pain the same way we do. When, when, when we wake up from a, from a surgery, um, we're, we're laying in bed oftentimes, whereas a rat wakes up from surgery, he's, wait, he's walking on the top of his cage. So they don't, they don't uh, sense it or interpret the sensations in the way that we necessarily do. But, um, but some of this, I think, you know, man, yeah. It's, I'm not sure it was worth it for some of these experiments. They did that same thing with a gentleman who, who had a, a, a terrible wound with his stomach, but, you know, they, they would anesthetize that part of his body and then, and then watch his digestive system, too. So, so, um, so but I guess my, the short answer is, I don't know if I can give a short answer, can I? But the, 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 uh, the short answer is this, that sometimes the costs are, are worth it, I think, Mm -hmm. Other times, not. And that has to be determined with, well, how valuable, what's this medicine going to do? And, uh, and, and uh, if it's going to save a life, then it, a human life, it's probably worth it. But if we can ameliorate that suffering, then we should do it. Thank you. Yes, I mean, that's within bioethics, research ethics is a big deal. And uh, yes, for any kind of advances in human medicine, animal animal experiments, animal mm -hmm. trials, is, uh, seems to be indispensable. So it is a question I have often um, as to, yeah, are, what alternatives are there um, to using animals in trials? Right, and you, you, you know, I have read this many times by the, well, I wouldn't say many times, but several times, by the animal rights people that we can just, well, we can just have, uh, have uh, computer programs that will tell us what will happen. And that is far from the truth, right? <laughs> um, in fact, it's not, even, it's not even for sure that this medicine that works in you is gonna work in me, right? And so, so why would we think that, it's gonna, it's, that we're gonna be able to know from a computer program? But we do gain a lot of knowledge from these animal studies. And they are important, but, but they can be seemingly cruel at the time sometimes. So one thing I really liked was your thesis eight, we are our brother's uh, ecosystems keeper. And I wonder if you comment on, uh, on this. Uh, we, every Christian knows that we should love our neighbor, but have we really thought enough about what it means to um, love our future neighbor and how our current actions can be undermining the welfare of, your, of our neighbor? And I thought your commentary was very good on um, uh, Luther's uh, comment about the, the seventh, seventh commandment, that to the extent that we damage the uh, environment on which our, our neighbor, present or future, depends, we are stealing from that individual. And I wonder if, if we need to have a, a more future-oriented um, approach to loving our neighbor, and if you'd like to comment on what role a church might, might play in, in encouraging that mindset? Well, thank you. Well, as was mentioned uh, earlier this morning, of course, of course, uh, uh, preaching the whole counsel of God, so preaching on this, uh, this aspect of the seventh commandment would be, would be one way in which the church can have this, uh, can have um, 
an effect upon the people that are sitting and listening to that. And it is, of course, the gospel that will motivate. Um, what else might the church do? The ch well, the church might have drives to, in very practical ways, if that's what you mean, uh, drives to clean things up, go clean up the riverbank or, or, uh, um, or the side of the highway, right? You see that oftentimes. I see, I see driving through Minnesota sometimes this section of the highway is, is, uh, is being cleaned up by so-and-so Lutheran, Lutheran church or, or an auxiliary of the Lutheran church or something. And those are, those are some practical ways and, uh, and, and sometimes maybe conf confrontation, um, a gentle confrontation with somebody maybe who, who isn't doing this. I'll give you an example. So we live on an old farmstead, and there was a gigantic barn that was there that was a dairy barn, and we have since taken it down because it was dilapidated. But, but in the, in the, the bottom, uh, in the floor of this barn were two big pipes that ran from the barn down the side of the hill right, right beside this barn and into a creek that feeds into the Lesur River. And that's where all the manure and all the waste was washed whenever they cleaned the dairy barn after they had milked the cows twice a day. And so this is going to eutrophy the the, the Lasur River, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause algal blooms in this river and turn the river green and make it, and, and have coliform bacteria in that river so that people may get infected when they go swimming. And, and so um, those kinds of things, I think, are now against the law. But back then, it, it wasn't. And yet, frankly, I'm not even sure that, he, that the farmer that lived there even thought it was necessarily harming anything um, in, in those days, maybe not in the 1950s and, and such, but, um, but it certainly was harming the Lesur River and the people that, that swim in it and fish in it. And, and you, get, you get very many of those dairy barns right beside, right beside the Lesur River, and, and, uh, and you've just got a mucky mess, you know, right? Uh, um, so, so I think that at times we might, we might need to to gently mention to some people, you know, um, you know this, 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 uh, this oil you pour on your driveway, if you have a dirt driveway, you're not going to do it if you have a paved driveway, but, but this oil you're pouring on your driveway has been shown to seep down into the water table eventually, and maybe, maybe it'd be a good idea not to do that anymore. So, I mean, so, so maybe we just have to sometimes mention things to the people that we know, and our relatives and things, and, and, uh, and, I'm, and, and support, I suppose, the other, well, yeah, I don't know. I think I'll, I think, I think I'll just let it go, let it ride with that before I say something political there. <laughs> I started to. At this point, is this working? At this point, we'd like to take questions from the audience here. Hello. Hello. Hello, I'm uh, Benjamin Foster. I'm a student at Martin Luther College in New Ulm. Uh, my question is for Dr. Holberg. Uh, considering how we can be best uh, uh, good stewards to our environment, and given the recent uh, rising of electric vehicles, what would you think is the best way for a Christian to be a good steward to our environment, electric or internal combustion <laughs> vehicles? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. This might be opinionated too, so I... Yes, yeah, yeah. Just, just, this will just be my opinion and for what it's worth and it's not much. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I'm not a believer that it's very helpful to have electric vehicles. That it, let me say it another way, that it's, that it's any more helpful than having uh, gasoline-driven vehicles. The cost of the environment is, is pretty great to come up with the rare earth elements and things that are used in some of those batteries. Now, now I, I will say, a, a new battery has been invented uh, that uses common materials, and 
and I just read about it the other day, and if this turns out to work, and it, and I'm, I mean, they were very common. I, I, I cannot recall what it was, though, which is the way my mind usually works. Remember reading something, but don't remember what I read. Um, uh, but if that becomes the case, then it might, be, it might be very helpful. But as it stands now, the energy that it takes to build one of those cars, uh, from what I have heard, it takes seven or eight years of driving the car to make up for that. Uh, in addition, you've got the cost of the, of the generation of the electricity that it takes to charge them. Now, my son drives a Tesla, so, so, and he likes it, and, and it, it's really nice. But, um, and nice and quiet. I mean, there's, there are advantages to it. And I would not say uh, that, that someone is sinning and driving an electric car. Sure. It's just my opinion that it, it's not that helpful environmentally, at least not yet. It may turn out to, to be one of these days. And, and we, you know what? Sooner or sometime, the oil's going to be gone, and, and we probably ought to have an alternative, or else we're just going to walk, you know, horses or something. But anyway, but yes. Yeah, I, that, so that's my opinion, and, uh, and there you have it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I am Davis Smith. I am a senior here at BLC studying liberal arts. Question for all three of you. The ethics of love comes up a lot throughout all of your papers. Um, the idea of love being the driving factor behind how we relate to our fellow men. Now, in our culture, that is an easy thing to accept when we're dealing with things like social justice, right? Of course, we should love those who are oppressed and those who are in circumstances with, from which they would wish to escape. However, when it comes to ethical issues that people think concern more of the individual alone, that becomes difficult. So, for example, um, things we might not think about, such as our ethical relationship to the unborn baby or to the environment, or even to ourselves um, as we strive to become the kind of person whom we were created to be. And so what's difficult to do in this culture is to speak in a loving spirit and to get people to understand that you are coming from that loving stance when you are advocating things that they cannot get it into their minds that they're actually acts of love. Um, so the Christian idea of love is recognizing our fellow humans as image bearers of God and therefore um, wanting them to, to achieve that nature and to, um, to become fully human in the truest sense. So what are some practical tips for coming across in a loving spirit when you're dealing with very personal issues like transgenderism and abortion and sexual ethics and things that people would think, well, that only concerns myself. How dare you tell me that I cannot live my life the way I choose to do, or I cannot do whatever I want with other consenting adults, um, when really ethics is not just a matter of protecting those who are obviously being oppressed, but of loving others and um, showing that proper attitude of love because we want people to recognize what it truly is to be human. What are some practical tips for doing that with people so that you don't turn them off? I'll, uh, I'll answer um, since I'm on a time limit here. <laughs> um, well, that's a very good question and it's very relevant to bioethics in all of our fields for sure. Um, I, I have a couple of suggestions. Uh, one is, well first, you're absolutely right, love is the uh, fulfillment of the law. And to love your neighbor sometimes means to say things that make them uncomfortable um, because telling the truth is a loving act. But uh, also, uh, when you are talking to someone specifically about, let's say, abortion or transgender, then uh, I recommend that you do so face to face as much as possible. Now that may seem like, oh, a no-brainer, but uh, I have found that having uncomfortable conversations with people to their face is more productive than any other way. The other thing is to, and again, these seem like no-brainers, but let me just say it, is to pray for that person. Because I've also found that uh, praying for someone uh, over time tends to draw you to them and uh, creates empathy. And, uh, and, 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 and that's very important. For someone to listen to you say something, uh, the divine will of, you know, the will of God, which may go against their um, desires uh, or feelings, um, they will respond better 
if you have established a sense of empathy on your part, right? And um, they will care what you say when they know that you care. <laughs> Um, so those are, uh, again, those may not seem like all that earth-shaking, but I would say talk to people, right? Talk to people face-to-face. -face. Let's get off the social media, let's stop, you know, these things, uh, and, and talk to people face-to-face. -face. And that might mean, um, it, you know, I'm avert to, I have an aversion to conflict, uh, but I have to get over that. Because <laughs> I teach bioethics, and everything in bioethics is controversial and the source of conflict, potentially. Speak to people face-to-face. Uh, so much of the, um, of the tension and hostility in our society, in every human society when it comes to moral teaching is, well, it's very counterproductive. People that are yelling at each other aren't listening to each other. Uh, when we go from zero to 60 on the wrath scale it, so quickly, which everyone does on, this, we're in a culture of not, I said a moment ago, we're in a culture of panic, but we're also in a culture of wrath. Uh, and that's why you see people shouting at each other, bullying each other, trying to intimidate each other, and cancel or dox and all these kinds of terminology. Why is it seemingly worse and worse? And I think it's because we are losing the capacity to have rational conversations with people without getting mad or feeling threatened. So that's a skill. So if we can develop that skill, it will do a great deal to calm down things down and people are more likely to hear your word if they don't listen to your word. Like we heard today in our, in our chapel sermon, it's not just that the vibrations in the air need to uh, you know, tremble whatever organs in your ear to hear. We must speak in a way that it is heard. And uh, the Holy Spirit is the power of the gospel and the word. But uh, it, it, we have to work at it. We have to, as a, as a church, this should be a priority for us, learning how to communicate. Uh, I was mentioning at lunch that I, one of the presentations I do commonly, I call, um, ineloquently I call it, uh, how to have a fruitful conversation with people you strongly disagree with. And uh, so, so that's, these are just some of my uh, tactics for that. Um, and that should be something we actually work harder at, I believe. Yeah, I would second that. A good first move is always to say, well, let's talk about it because you show love to a person when you're willing to hear them out, even when you expect that most of what you hear you're going to disagree with. And on the autonomy issue, I think we need to just gently show them that it is not loving to allow people to make self-destructive uh, choices. We've confused love with a, a, a kind of a entitlement or permission, and they're just not the same thing. Uh, there's nothing more unloving, actually, than allowing the, the drug addict to keep on taking drugs until he kills himself. And the same thing is true with some of these other issues, that we can show that we care about them. Gender dysphoria is a, is a real problem that people suffer from, but we can patiently show them there's very strong evidence that the procedures that some are offering them won't help with that problem. What they need is counseling and love. Um, they, they need someone to help them work through this problem, not someone who is actually going to give them additional problems, some of them long-lasting physical problems and, and proneness to um, various um, uh, negative health outcomes. You shouldn't be Shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing that at all, but encouraging them to see that, no, we care about their welfare and offering them those uh, alternatives. And I think it's just going to be a lot more hard work, listening and developing a relationship with these people till they get to the point that we see that we actually care more about their good than those that they have been listening to. I'd like to second what both of them have said. I'd just like to add this, that sometimes you have to just get to know somebody, and you have to know them for a while before, um, before they're willing to listen to you. And, and, and that's, that's not always easy, especially if you don't like the way they behave toward you. But um, so oftentimes, in, when you have a relationship with somebody that is ex an extended relationship over a period of time and you have, you have shown them that you care about them and you've shown them again and you've shown them again and you've shown them 
that even though your opinion is different from theirs, you, you're not holding it against them. You, you know, you, you're not, uh, you don't think they're weird. You, well, you might, but you don't, tell, you don't let them know that. And, 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 uh, anyway. <laughs> but um, no, but you, you show them that you really do um, have concern for them. Oftentimes, the, the, the time will, and then pray, uh, like Dr. Stigmeyer said, for the opportunity to broach these issues. Uh, obviously, sometimes you don't have time for these extended relationships, and, uh, and you, you just you know, have to broach the conversation anyway. But, but, but when we are able to establish those relationships, I remember uh, when I was in grad school, it was, uh, it, I had known a, a worker in our lab, and, and she was an, an agnostic, and, uh, and it took probably three years or four years of knowing her before she finally said, how do you cope with all the, with all the issues in life? And I was able then to, to witness to her about the Lord Jesus at that point and, uh, and tell her that, well, I, um, I have a savior who watches over me, so I don't have to worry about a lot of things. So, except, except giving talks like this morning. But. Yeah, that, that was great. Just one quick thing. Uh, Lewis's approach, I think, is the best. He wrote to Sheldon Van Orken, think of me uh, as a fellow patient in the same hospital who, because he was admitted a little earlier, could give some advice. In other words, in the end, there's nothing of ourselves. We're not saying we're better than them in any way but what we can offer them is, is Christ. Thank you. Um, my name is Kyle During. I'm a social studies education major at Martin Luther College. So my question is, um, it's kind of off of the electric car thing, but if we, for example, in California recently, there's been legislation up that um, would require citizens to drive things like electric cars, if we believe that legislation or other things are in place that will impede on our Christian stewardship or is not the best course of action for us to use the resources which God has given us, how do we as Christians still show respect and reverence for those God has placed in authority over us while also doing what we believe to be the best job of being stewards of what we've been given? Yeah, that's really, a, in, in my area, I mean, I think we must respect their office because the office is instituted by God, but at the same time, we must hold them accountable if we think, in fact, that though they say that they're doing this for the good of the environment, we've got cogent arguments to show that either its effect is neutral uh, or possibly, in some cases, it's um, uh, negative. Um, there, are, there are some uh, environmental uh, approaches like using, um, you know, uh, uh, basically geo geomass and things of this kind where they're, they're, they're urging us to use alternative fuels where you can make a very strong argument that their net effect is actually negative. And so if they've said that this is for the sake of the environment, I think we should be keen to get together and make the case that no, this will have a negative impact on the environment and uh, we, we have a reason to oppose your, your policy. Thank you. I'm Professor Tom Rank, uh, Religious Studies here at Bethany. Uh, Dr. Manoush, I've got a couple of questions on page 11 of your uh, presentation. Uh, two things that I, I think are related, but I want to uh, begin with the second full paragraph, the last uh, sentence there. You had just been talking about this pastor reading uh, both Christian and Muslim, and you conclude by saying, the problem is that the office of Christian minister does not authorize clergy to act as representatives of other religions. And I'd like to narrow that because I would say in the circles in which I generally travel, confessional Lutheran pastors and theologians, uh, there I would say the, the mix of Christian and non-Christian does not occur. But what does occur is the fact that some Lutheran ministers end up perhaps unwittingly representing other denominations mm. in how they mm -hmm. practice. 
Uh, and then I think that ties in with the uh, last paragraph about the tendency to adopt secular business models and then the uh, second to last line, and some human technique has the power to save. And I see a common thread between these, and that is finally a lack of trust in the efficacy of the word. Other denominations think you have to add something to God's word. Business models are a way to try and do that. And I just want to know if you have any comments on that. Yeah, so there's a couple of um, points there. So one thing is that um, even within uh, one denomination, the, 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 the pastor has, has sworn that he's going to be faithful to the confessions of that particular denomination. It seems to me that that then means that he has voluntarily bound his conscience, just as uh, Luther uh, at Worms says, my, my conscience is held captive to the Word of God. And this is just analogous to those individuals in the um, police force who were ordered to do things during the lockdowns, which they judged were contrary to their oath to maintain the Constitution. So you're absolutely right. Uh, if someone claims to be a representative of a particular denomination and they've sworn to uphold its confessions, then they are required and, and, and should, should do so. Um, and um, yeah, this, the second point is this kind of blurring on the li of, of the lines. I see this everywhere, that when it comes to management, it's as if a switch is thrown in people's mind in various, institu in, in, in various institutional settings. And that is to say that when they're talking about individual matters and uh, their, their piety from day to day, they recognize Christian ethical principles. But when it comes to managing an organization, they tend to get most of their marching orders from the, the latest business practices. And I, and I see this sometimes in institutions of Christian uh, higher learning, and it creeps into the church itself when it adopts um, models of church growth and marketing, which seem to be strongly informed by extra biblical uh, principles. It's what uh, those individuals have judged is most appealing for people to hear right now. Well, if that is entirely compatible and congruent with God's word, I guess that might be okay, but it seems to me that sometimes it's not. It's, it's actually walking away from our call to boldly proclaim the gospel and instead saying, well, what's a kind of a more nuanced message? That, and as sort of, we, we, we substitute something ambiguous or ambivalent, thinking that that will be less offensive or more a, appealing. I don't think we're authorized to do that. I think that that's uh, disloyal to Christ's command. He didn't say that we should, in the Great Commission, that we should go out and uh, get higher degrees in marketing and find out how to uh, advance my brand. Thank you. Erling yeah. <laughs> Tagen from Bethany. Uh, yes, yesterday, the question came up about preaching uh, on the, some of these issues, about some of these issues that we were talking about, and I think that it was dealt with very well. But while that discussion was going on, I, st I had a vision pass, flash before my eyes of a church body telling, or one of our synods, uh, deciding that there should be an eco Sunday uh, in your churches during this year. Uh, and you know, I can imagine what that would, what would happen. Pretty soon it would be like having 52 Mother's Day sermons in a row. <laughs> but, but, but there's a much better way, and I think that there, there, we should step back a little bit and think about it. Uh, first of all, when we talk about creation, we have a tend to, uh, we, we talk about the, the creator, okay? But we forget that according to scripture, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, is the agent of creation. And so when we talk about creation and when we remind people of the holiness of this, that it has to be connected to Christ, 
And if in people, if we if we instill in people's minds uh, the importance of creation, it involves not just you know the Father, <laughs> but this is the Son who also is our Redeemer. Uh, think how much more helpful that might be for many people. And then the other thing that I'd remind us of, our preaching has to be formed by the church's confession, and that means by the three articles. And we can't leave out the preaching of the first article. And that's going to be there not only in the sense of law, but it's also going to be a part of the gospel. And if the first article is to be taken seriously, then we have to take seriously what it is that's been created. And so if anyone wants to respond to that, I'd certainly commend it. Well, that was a very rich uh, question. One thing that I think we can learn, I think, I think we should always approach issues in theology through, through Christ. I think that's kind of a distinctively Lutheran approach to theology. And uh, one tie-in um, with stewardship issues is to see that what Jesus says about you sh to his disciples about we shouldn't lord it over others, right, that we should be servants, I think that applies to environmental stewardship that, so that when we are entrusted with much, just as Christ came to be uh, came, to came to serve and not to be served and give his life as a ransom for many. Even though we've been entrusted with the creation, um, it remains the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You, you quoted several, se several times. And that means that in a Christ-like way, we are called to care for the good of what has been entrusted into our, our care. And I think that way of putting it would be um, more faithful to the idea that we should read issues through, through Christ's, Christ's example and what he has, has done, and also might be uh, more, more appealing. And, I'm, and I will just add that, um, of course, it is through uh, Christ's death and resurrection that the new creation is going to be ours also, so uh, the new, new heaven and earth. We still have about 15 minutes for additional questions, and maybe why some of us think about those. One of the questions that's come to my mind is that Lutherans seem to be a little unclear about the question of, is it just the individual as individual that has a responsibility of care for the neighbor, uh, social concern, or does the church as church, and obviously the church as the believers united with the means of grace, but does the church as church have a responsibility to that? I mean, down through history and down through the Lutheran tradition, we've had places where the church um, has been instrumental in that social care. We've also had other questions, others down through the ages, especially in light of uh, the social gospel movement that have been reticent to come back and talk about the church having an obligation to that. Um, how would you respond to that? Uh, wh why is there confusion uh, on that, and how would you answer that question? Well, I think that historically the, the body of Christ has been uh, used in all kinds of social care. So in the beginning of the early church, they were the ones who were taking in uh, children who had been abandoned on dying heaps. They were the ones who were taking care of the sick who had been fled. They instituted education for more and more uh, individuals. And it is a responsibility of the church, and I think it's something that the church does better than the government. I've written on this. The, the trouble with saying, well, the government can, can do this, is in effect it creates an anonymous relationship of entitlement. Well, you get some kind of check from a federal official. Whereas when you have food pantries or you have some kind of um, church-operated system, you actually meet an individual who cares, who helps you, and it seems to me that that's what inspires people who've been beneficiaries uh, of these church-based charities, uh, then to volunteer their services too, and also though, they encounter 
the gospel in a very concrete way, and oftentimes they will end up joining the, the, the church as well. And we should not be ceding these kinds of issues simply to the role of the impersonal uh, government. If we do that, I think that we encourage people to put their trust in, in princes. One of the things I wondered, especially when I was a pastor, was if our, our lives, and this is, I don't know if this is uniquely American. I don't think it is. I think it's uniquely modern, maybe. Our lives are so fragmented that church is just one of the fragments of our lives. And we don't, we, we don't work together really well. Uh, we don't make each other a, a, a big part of our lives. Um, and that's what it takes, I think, to do what you were suggesting, Tim, is, is really, um, we have to think about not just my kids, but m other people's kids in our church, and, and, and the orphans, and what can we do uh, to, you know, to, uh, to meet their needs. And to do that, you have to be together and figure out, together with other people, what we can do, and how how do we even know who has needs? It's, we, we figure that out by people telling us, and, right? And so I just wonder if, if maybe that is one of Satan's temptations in, I don't know, this modern era where we, we, we get in our cars and we drive to church for an hour, you know? And, and then, and that's, for some of us, that's about the extent of it, and for others, it's more involved. But, but do, you, do you know what I mean? And we're not as much, we're, we're not as much, um, the, uh, what am I trying to say? We're, we don't have the same characteristics of, of ministry to each other in, in uh, physical ministry, right? And, and uh, that the early church had, and had for each other, you know? And I wish I knew how to get it, but I, you know. Yeah, I, I think it's such an interesting question because so often we think of clear sedes doctrina for the church doing evangelism, clear sedes doctrina for the church doing catechesis, uh, clear sedes doctrina for worship. But when it comes to Christian service, sometimes people want to say, well, Christian as individuals should do that. And there's questions we've had about that, and the Lutheran tradition hasn't always been as clear on that, so I appreciate that. Um, we still have, we still have time for, oh, we have another speaker? Good. Hello, uh, my name is Douglas Lindy and I am a liberal arts major here at Bethany. Um, I'd like to uh, set the theme for my question with a rhetorical question, which is whose is man to manipulate? And I direct this uh, question to Dr. Uh, Holberg because of your um, experience in the medical field, but I'd also really like to hear what you have to say, Dr. Manoj. And uh, it's sort of a theological question, and that is at what point when you surrender a certain amount of your image of God in the physical sense, are you jeopardizing your salvation? And you can surrender it either by genetic alterations, say by uh, removing or uh, synthesizing yourself with another, with another creature, or perhaps artificially with um, uh, cybernetic implants as we've seen with, uh, in a primitive sense, with people with their cell phones, a lot of their identity is stored in the internet, but soon, um, companies such as Meta and others are producing brain chips to interface with computers. At what point, when you sacrifice a certain amount of your free will and your physical image, are you jeopardizing uh, your salvation by sinning against the Holy Spirit? This, I believe, is a question that people of my generation will have to deal with. And um, I'm looking for some guidance as I think through this. Well, I have not associated the image of God with physicality, really. Um, but I, get, I think I get your meaning. That if, if I understand what you're saying, there, does there come a point um, where we can alter ourselves so much um, that, that we are not what God intends us to be as, as human beings, is that it? Is that sort of it? I... Yes, um, sort of the essential components of being a human. 
that would be your mind, your free will, and those in a uh, great capacity are linked with your uh, DNA and your, um, your physical nature too. What's the relationship? And are, and are you sort of um, thinking of things like Neuralink and um, with, uh, um, who is that, that's um, Musk? With, with his Neuralink and things where, um, yes. where the brain, brain implants and things? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> I'll defer. There's a metaphysical side to that, and that is whether we can actually be self-creators. Oswald Bayer has a, a famous paper on this, right? And, the, and of course, on one level, the answer has to be no, because you can't get something from uh, nothing. We can't make ourselves a fundamentally different kind of being. What we can do is give ourselves all, all kinds of different functional capacities. The problem is that we are thereby defining ourselves in terms of what we can do. However, right, that doesn't change who we are in the eyes of God as we are, as, as we are created. But what it might do is lead people to think that they have made themselves into another kind of being and thereby implicitly to reject their creator. So I think the real issue is that we might get to a point that people believe that they're entirely in charge of them, themselves, and therefore at that point they're rejecting anything that's given, and if they reject their given nature, they are indeed very likely to reject grace of all kinds, and then indeed their salvation would be in jeopardy. But it started because of that delusional idea that they can radically redefine who they who they are, right? It's a bit like the the um, the prodigal son um, by leaving his fa father and accept taking his uh, inheritance early. What's he doing? He's treating his father in effect as dead, isn't he? Right? And saying, I can make an identity for my myself, and in doing that, he basically makes himself an orphan, and he, he, he right. Fortunately, he is readopted. So we should certainly pray that these people will come to their senses, just like the prodigal son, and they can be restored. But I think it's going to be a major illusion of our time that man can essentially recreate himself, and that's something we need to address. And this is really insidious, and I think the Christian bioethicists will, will have to give us guidance as this goes along, because who... Who in here would would object to a brain implant that allows uh, somebody who's paralyzed to walk, right, or or to use their arms again? And but but of course that's not where the stopping point will be, will it? it, it it's going to go on, and and uh, people will be using this to modify other aspects of their bodies, and and uh, and like you said, uh, give themselves new capabilities, and so. Uh, this is going to be something, I think, that will really have to be answered. But where the line is you know, between helping a lame person walk and, and going beyond that and endangering the soul, I don't know. Thank you very much. Pastor John Palm from Trinity Lutheran Church in North Morristown, Minnesota. Um, as perhaps it looks like my last, the last question, um, a lot of the time has been spent articulating the frailties and flaws of our understanding of uh, ethics uh, that we have and uh, how theologically we can have a more robust ethics and a, a better understanding of things and thus benefit the world. Most of the world doesn't want to hear it um, natural law has been uh, worked with quite a bit to try to articulate Christian ethics into a secular world. How sufficient is that as a tool? Or are we just required to proclaim our Christian ethics, Jesus and all, and uh, let people see the fruits of it to accept it? or simply to reject it 
knowing full well what it is that we are offering. I think the early church gives the answer that the second option is the most effective. We live, we live out that faith and by the, the fruits of it, they begin to see what Christianity has to offer. Natural law is very helpful, I think, at the level of getting reasonable concessions in the, at the legal level where you have to give those kinds of um, arguments, but it is much less than a full embodied Christian witness, which has historically always involved a community making tremendous sacrifices for others that clearly benefit others. And then people have been kind of astonished and taken back. Where does this come from? Why are these people doing this? And that is an argument of a, it's not an intellectual argument. It's a, there it is, look at it. And it leads people to reconsider in their, in their heart uh, where they've been living before. So I, I think that is the better option. Yeah, I think there's no doubt, uh, right, that that's the better option. There is, I think, a separate use for the natural law sometimes. Um, and that is in, in, in just trying to keep this world a place where we want our kids to grow up in it, you know, and that kind of thing. And that may be another use of it. Um, that's sort of selfish, I suppose, but maybe we could say to a place where we want other children to grow up too and not be exposed to the to pressure to become transgender or pressure to do this or that. And in that way, the natural law can have a use also, I think. But. Um, but it sure isn't gonna, it sure isn't gonna lead to permanent change, is it? And, and it's not the permanent change we're seeking except, per, except for the permanent change of the heart. This question will kind of uh, connect to the question that the other Schmeling had here a little earlier. Um, and uh, the very first essay uh, there was a quote by, um, I think it was Dr. Fulton Hauer, probably was Missouri Synod president at the time. And he wrote, the real business of the church is to preach the gospel. It is not the mission of the church to abolish physical mi misery or to help men to earthly happiness. And Many people of my generation were raised with that attitude that when it came to uh, 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 doing things like uh, uh, standing near the pro-life, uh, pro the, the clinic here in town, whatever it's called, that that was not the responsibility of the local congregation, that was the responsibility of individual Christians. Uh, would you agree with that, or are, the t are you implying that uh, right with preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments, uh, we are responsible as a church to provide for the needs of the hungry and so forth? Or is that individual Christians' responsibilities? Those are the, those are the that's an issue I think that um, I don't quite see clearly today. I thought I saw it clearly with Fotenhauer. I think that kind of concern should be a, 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 a fruit of the faith and when the church will do it as, as a body collectively, I should see it as an apologetic and so that it doesn't get away in the fact that of course the primary mission of the, the church is to share the gospel but what was it in the early church that made some people listen to the gospel? It was at first that they saw what the church was doing and so that that care for others, I think, functioned as a kind of pre-evangelism or as an apologetic. It got people's attention long enough that then the gospel um, had, 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 a chance to re had the chance to reach them. So um, I'm not sure if the entire church, I don't, I don't like the idea of it becoming something that's required by the entire church body, but if individual churches have a strong group of people 
um, who will, will do that as a witness, then I, I say uh, that they, they should do so. Well, I think that it would be a church committee. I think, for example, of uh, my, my wife who does a, a, a prayers or a pro-life group, and it involves clergy, including a member of uh, our church and also some uh, devout uh, Catholics. And I think, I think the fact that there is both a uh, church witness in the sense that clergy involved, inv involved and laity are involved is, is powerful, and I think it's... Uh, it's a good witness. It's a way of showing that the, that the church and not just individuals within the church cares about these matters. So that's the side I would uh, take on it. I'm just curious. This is related to this, but sort of on a tangent. Uh, you know, you go to Chicago and there's a Lutheran hospital, and I think there used to be one in Mankato. And, and, uh, were those established by a congregation? Were they established by a district? Or? Yes, by congregation. By congregation. Okay, so. Or Chicago association. Okay, and so. Ah, so it was a congregation that started uh, Emmanuel Hospital. Okay. But in other places, there was an association like our new place in Gary High School. Yes. It just seems that historically the body of Christ has more effectively functioned as a body than it is in our current individualistic context. Well, with that, we're at time, so I want to thank the speakers, first of all. Next, I wanted to thank our audience for your attention, your engagement, and all the questions that you raised to our speakers. Uh, this year's uh, lectures, as always, will be posted on the college's YouTube site. Um, in addition, uh, they'll be printed with any kind of edits or any additions that the speakers would like to make. In the March edition of the Lutheran Synod Quarterly, I want to encourage all of you uh, to consider uh, subscribing. So, and President Harwick, I did my due diligence on that, right? So, good. No, no, but seriously, I encourage you uh, to subscribe to that. Uh, last, I want to announce next year's topic is the 50th anniversary of Seminex. And it's going to be uh, a LCMS perspective, a Wells perspective, and an ELS perspective. And we already have agreement on our speakers, and it'll be the three uh, synodical presidents, President Harrison, uh, President Trader, and President Ovenberger. So we're really looking forward to that. So hopefully uh, dangle that out there to make sure that you guys are all here. It should be a fun, lively discussion. And with that, I wish you all the uh, Lord's blessings, safe travels until we uh, see even hopefully even more next year. So take care.